Hello, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome you all uh, uh, at this uh, timely event uh, in very strange times uh, because it's taking place. Uh, it's taking place uh, as uh, Omicron, uh, <clears throat> uh, the new Transformers buddy, uh, uh, is around us in uh, in Europe, but also the new. Um, Travel guidances from uh, Italian authorities have prevented, uh, talking about a double whammy, have prevented uh, uh, our speakers, uh, uh, most of them, uh, to join us uh, here in Florence. But we are delighted to have a friend coming from afar, as Confucius would say, <clears throat> and uh, Chisako Masuo, Professor Chisako Masuo um, from Kyushu University, uh, is here in the flesh. Uh, oddly enough, uh, um, uh, the uh, guest coming from uh, the farthest, the furthest, uh, is, is here in Florence. <clears throat> um, and uh, we are going to take advantage of um, this uh, distinguished um, uh, lineup of um, um, specialists uh, on uh, uh, the international politics, especially the security. Um, uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of East Asia with uh, an emphasis on maritime security, broadly defined, because as you will see um, today, we are dealing with, um, uh, of course, a uh, period of flux in world politics uh, centered on China's re-emergence to regional centrality and a more assertive, some might call it aggressive push to secure its own, what it perceives as its, as its own interests. And uh, these, um, this assertiveness is coupled by a major pushback by the US and also by uh, some of the countries in the, in the front line uh, of uh, uh, the so-called Indo-Pacific. And uh, I'm thinking of course of Japan, <clears throat> uh, Australia. And we will explore today um, what is uh, the nature of China's uh, uh, maritime engagement in the past few years. Uh, by having uh, <clears throat> a distinguished specialist uh, on uh, Chinese uh, foreign and security policy, especially maritime politics uh, and maritime policy with a, an act for an analysis uh, centered on bureaucratic politics uh, and uh, domestic actors. And that's uh, Professor Chisako Masuo from Kyushu University. And we will, we will then continue with um, uh, um, an analysis of how Japan has uh, fleshed out a free and open Indo-Pacific uh, strategy, which I would like to emphasize is not to start with an American initiative. It is probably the first time in uh, post-war American history that uh, um, Japan was able, uh, an Asian ally, an American Asian ally was able to endow and sell at the very least a narrative um, in favor of a free and open Indo-Pacific um, to, uh, to the US. <clears throat> so it's the first time that the US government appropriated an initiative um, that originated um, um, elsewhere uh, in Asia among uh, its allies. Um, and Eva <clears throat> Peshova, the senior Japan fellow at the Free University of, Bra uh, of Brussels, will uh, then uh, uh, tell us uh, how is it that Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific uh, um, is uh, adjusting to a rapidly evolving and transforming uh, a regional strategic landscape. And then we pass the baton to um, Lindsay Black, who is a senior lecturer at uh, Leiden University, and um, his focus is on East Asian um, uh, security and politics dynamics. Uh, but again, Lindsay is a Japan specialist uh, uh, by training and has written extensively on Japanese uh, maritime uh, posture, especially the Coast Guard to start with. And he will explore Sino-Japanese competition in Southeast Asia, uh, not necessarily in the maritime field, but in the maritime field broadly defined, and so infrastructure uh, competition as well. And Chris Wirth, <clears throat> who is uh, uh, at the uh, uh, very um, uh, prestigious GIGA uh, Institute in Hamburg, is uh, uh, also going to look at um, maritime security, but this time we will focus on how Europe will uh, uh, react and respond uh, to, uh, uh, to, these, uh, to these dynamics. And so without further ado, I will leave the floor to our uh, speakers. Uh, um, and I guess uh, Chisa has some slides. Uh, 
you can use the pointer and I will just press the S button and uh, sh actually share the screen. Okay, um, I have to share the screen because it has been disabled. <clears throat> Uh, bear with me, please. We uh, uh, are having technical uh, issues that will uh, be sorted out uh, rapidly. Perhaps um, you could start uh, without the slides. Can you see me? <laughs> no, we can't. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, can I put this? Yeah, you can. You can uh, as you prefer. Oh, okay. So uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here today. Uh, it's my re uh, really big pleasure to be able to talk to you uh, today. Uh, I, was, I was originally hoping to be able to see uh, some more speakers, uh, but unfortunately, uh, well, many things happen and uh, that's uh, not possible now, but I hope I'll see you uh, in person uh, in the near future. So, um, uh, well, time is limited. Uh, I would like to move on to my uh, talk uh, right now. Um, so uh, today uh, I am. Is it moving? No, it's just that it needs to be at five, right? Oh. <clears throat> what? Can we just press this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as well. Yeah. Can you see the slides? Yeah. Can you? Okay. Can you see yes, this? Right okay, okay, great. So uh, uh, briefly, I would like to talk to uh, uh, talk about uh, China's uh, Coast Guard law, uh, which China enacted uh, February this year, and our well, my concern about this law, this new law. Well, uh, China enacted this law, and uh, at that time, uh, uh, many Japanese experts uh, criticized. This law, and oh, actually, I was one of them. Well, probably, I was the uh, first person who uh, started to uh, criticize this law uh, when uh, it, uh, its draft was uh, publicized in uh, November last year. Um, and uh, well, people argue that uh, that this law uh, is very. Uh, it could be uh, very dangerous uh, because uh, legalize the use of law. We use a weapon. We use a weapons uh, in the jurisdiction water. China claims China is claiming a huge size of water in both uh, East China Sea and South China Sea, and actually uh, uh, in the Yellow Sea as well. So it's claiming uh, three million square square kilometers of jurisdiction water, and more than half of that is disputed by other uh, claimants. So, and, and that size equals to, about, uh, equals to the size of Mongolia. So it's a huge area, uh, it's claiming. Um, uh, but uh, my idea was slightly different about the law. Uh, well, of course, the conditions for the use of law, uh, the use of weapons, is very loose in that law. So it's a, it's also a problem. But I thought um, the possibility China might uh, take actions in uh, its claiming jurisdiction water uh, was very serious. So that's why I uh, tried to criticize that law to prevent China to take to create uh, bigger programs to enhance uh, its governance over its claiming water. Well, uh, so far, uh, not many new things are happening. As you can see the slide, um, uh, well, uh, this, is, uh, this slide shows the number of China Coast Guard 
and other vessels uh, that entered into uh, Japan's contiguous zone, uh, which illustrated with the blue lines and also uh, the number of uh, vessels uh, intruded into the territorial sea. Uh, which is uh, surrounding Senkaku Islands, which is illustrated in uh, red. Um, if you look at this, uh, it's clear that the number had been relatively stable recently. So you don't see huge uh, jump. Uh, but the problem is uh, basically, well, it, it's, it only shows the number of the vessels uh, who came into the zones. And basically now uh, Chinese uh, vessels, Chinese official vessels are staying in those places. And uh, there are there are many um, Japan, Japan Coast, Guard, uh, Coast Guard ships uh, trying to deter uh, China's uh, Chinese actions. So uh, those uh, two groups of ships are always confronting in that area. And uh, starting last year, actually Chinese official vessels started to chase uh, Japanese fishing vessels. So it's a new action and uh, we are very um, uh, worried about this too. But um, uh, what I was worried about uh, uh, the uh, Coast Guard law was that um, well, the, well, I'm not exactly sure if you have take, uh, taken an opportunity to read those law, but actually it's draft and the later law uh, has, uh, has used very different words. Well, uh, the, when they uh, officially legalized the law, uh, they also invited uh, public comments and many uh, international law specialists also entered into the debate. So uh, if you look at those words, uh, they relatively seem to be mild, much milder than the draft. But the draft was uh, uh, written by the people in the uh, Central Military Commission. And their intention uh, seemed to be much, uh, well, and it, it was much easier to see their intentions in that draft. And uh, in that draft, uh, it also, uh, well, the draft was publicized with the uh, explanation given uh, by the person, uh, the re uh, responsible person who came from the Central Military Commission and spoke to uh, the uh, uh, people's <laughs> to the, uh, uh, to the uh, legalizing body. And uh, he explained uh, about some of the intentions in the draft um, uh, relating to the Senkaku Islands, probably. Uh, he mentioned that uh, China needs to take actions uh, in the contiguous zone, uh, China, uh, we uh, basically uh, China. Uh, we want to create a new uh, measures in uh, that relates to the security in the contiguous zone. He mentioned, and uh, if you uh, see, uh, you know, you know, uh, if there is no territorial sea, there is no te uh, contiguous zone. And if you see uh, which part of the disputed islands uh, China have set the territory, uh, territorial sea, uh, well, uh, it's only about the Senkaku Otiaoyu Islands uh, that China is not actually uh, controlling. You know, uh, um, uh, in, in relation to the, the Spratly Islands, China hasn't set uh, the territorial sea yet. I think uh, when they uh, made the reclamation, uh, they were planning to do it, but because uh, then um, this became um, a huge international debate, uh, and uh, China kind of, kind of lost uh, in the uh, permanent court of arbitration. So um, it's, it hasn't set the territorial water yet. So I think uh, there's a clear intention that China wants to do something in the contiguous zone in around the Senkaku Islands. So that was my um, uh, uh, that was my interpretation of that uh, uh, law. Um, so uh, when China, well, China has been uh, trying to 
uh, increase its governance. Uh, <laughs> I have the slide. Uh, okay, okay. okay. Uh, did you see the second page slide? No? Mm -hmm. oh, this is difficult. <laughs> How do I do? I don't know. Uh, Well, uh, this is, yeah. is this okay? Uh, can you see? Uh, can you see this uh, new uh, slide? The second future action forecast. Uh, no, no, they can't. Forse ci sono più PowerPoint. Ah, eh, qualcuno l'ha lasciato aperto questo qui. <coughs> Wait. Maybe you can delete the first page. Forse ci sono più PowerPoint aperti. No. Yes, now it's here. Okay. 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 We'll okay. avoid the present. Can you can you read? Can you read uh, the slide? Okay. It's not in presentation mode. Maybe that's why it doesn't work automatically. It's in the. Now it is in presentation. Ah. Okay. Please. Can you read it? Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Oh, great. Um, uh, well, I have been uh, trying to uh, read China's uh, maritime intentions uh, by using their administrative documents. Um, and uh, so, uh, and, you know, well, people might argue that China takes uh, many various actions uh, in a very ad hoc way, but my view is very different. Uh, China is a huge uh, bureaucratic country, <laughs> huge democracy. And uh, every time they take uh, bigger actions, they uh, prepare uh, them in advance. So uh, this, well, I try to uh, illustrate how China takes actions using the bureaucracy. Um, well, so uh, there are five steps, uh, well, uh, roughly saying there are five steps in my understanding. And, uh, you know, when uh, uh, the leaders release new spirits, they call it, uh, the people, uh, the bureaucrats have to uh, go through the brainstorming period at, at the second stage. And then they go, if, they, if they regard necessary, necessarily, uh, they take the legislation action. And then uh, probably at the same time, uh, but based on the new uh, law, uh, they create a new sets of law uh, within the bureaucracy. And then uh, that's, that's step four. And uh, at the step five, uh, they formulate uh, new programs to uh, achieve uh, their new goals. So that's uh, the number five is almost like an action plan. Uh, new action plan for the bureaucrats. And Xi Jinping has been very strict to uh, his uh, subordinates. He's been demanding so much to, uh, for, uh, for, uh, demanding them to fulfill the goals in a very strict way. So if, they, if the bureaucrats uh, do not do it, uh, they can get fired. So they are very much uh, afraid of the new, this leader. So uh, if you think about this, um, you know, the number three is the legislation phase, and that's the Coast Guard law. Uh, when was it publicized? Uh, that was fall uh, this year. And uh, well, uh, at, in March, in March, uh, that was the end of the 13th five-year plan in China. So that means uh, starting from uh, this spring, uh, the last spring, China had entered into the 14th uh, uh, five-year uh, program period. And uh, at the same time, uh, China had uh, enacted uh, many other bigger, uh, uh, longer-term uh, programs. So um, I was very, I was very worried about those uh, because uh, according to my own studies uh, about the China's uh, South uh, Reclamation Plans, um, in the South China Sea, uh, China didn't do it in a very ad hoc way, as I, I have explained. Uh, first, in 2012, uh, China uh, uh, legislated island protection law. 
And then based on that, uh, uh, within the bureaucracy, uh, they created a new plan uh, to uh, strengthen the governance over uh, its claiming islands uh, in both uh, in South China Sea, basically. Uh, somehow at that time, uh, they didn't include Senkaku Islands. Uh, in my uh, well, based on my analysis, but uh, can you see the slide? China's island oh. management system oh, is that not. the slide? No, I can't see the slide. Oh, sorry, no, I am sorry. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm using too much time. Yeah, seeing from here, it's still not in the presentation mode. I don't know whether that might. Is your presentation? Where is the file? Eh, la vede chiuso anche quello. L'ho chiuso perché stava. This, no? Can you see the, the slide with uh, Beido? Can you can you see slides changing? Okay, okay. okay good. Thank okay. you, thank you. So uh, I'm really sorry. I'll try to conclude it as soon as possible. So uh, upon the reclamation in the South China Sea, um, China created in a program, uh, island uh, the first island island protection program. And then based on that, uh, they uh, started to uh, make the reclamation uh, from 2013. So uh, if the same formula applies to this time, um, I think uh, China is creating a very big program this time as well. Actually, um, there were new uh, movements uh, related to the maritime, China's maritime governance. Uh, China has been going through uh, fishery administration reforms. And if you uh, look into the details, it's very clear that it relates to the China's uh, huge satellite infrastructure uh, planning. Um, well, China is now uh, creating a national spatial infrastructure they call it. And uh, they are trying to connect the huge satellite infrastructure. Oh, they also argue that they are going to start a uh, uh, space-based internet in the near future. So <laughs> clearly, uh, well, Chinese are very always very creative. So they're using this new idea to monitor and control uh, the, uh, well, uh, not only it's a uh, claim in jurisdiction water, but I think actually the entire earth. So, uh, well, this is, a, I, I, in this graph, I illustrated how it is operated in the maritime domain. Um, so that's my worry. I think, well, this time uh, China has combined uh, many new, uh, well, uh, developing programs on the land and also the maritime area into a new, uh, they call a uh, national territory uh, and uh, uh, national territory and spatial program. Uh, 
but uh, somehow, for whatever reasons, uh, they stopped uh, publicizing this new plan. Uh, well, last year, about this year, uh, well, last year, about this time, uh, the uh, uh, nature and resource, uh, nature, uh, nature and resource department publicized that they are preparing uh, for this new uh, big program, uh, and uh, their uh, preparation uh, work has been doing very smoothly. So it's coming. They have pre uh, publicized, but somehow in the spring it didn't come come out. So uh, clearly there is this program going on, but it's not publicized. But I think uh, they're going to uh, utilize this uh, huge satellite network to increase its governance over the sea, uh, not only in the jurisdictional water, and, uh, but uh, to monitor the entire uh, global water and also the land. Um, or to, uh, uh, well, uh, well, that's what I'm saying <laughs> to the Japanese government recently. Uh, but as, uh, I don't think many people have taken it seriously yet. But anyhow, the um, Jap uh, Japanese government has uh, decided to increase the defense budget a little bit, and uh, it's making a lot of international cooperation. Uh, we are very uh, worried about the Taiwan Strait as well. Uh, and uh, I think uh, basically, well, it's impossible to contain China for sure. And it's, that's not our purpose. Uh, we just want to coexist. Uh, in a stable and peaceful manner. But it's very important to deter uh, Chinese military actions. That's uh, the way of thinking in Japan, basically. So um, uh, Kishida government has uh, agreed to increase the budget, basically. And also um, on the, yes, <laughs> okay. Uh, and on Taiwan uh, Strait, I think uh, we, we are uh, having a lot of international discussions with many other uh, allies and friends. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chisa. Thank you. We uh, will then uh, uh, pass the baton to uh, Eva. And uh, I'm sure that uh, <clears throat> it's actually going to be much easier technically to uh, connect <laughs> from your side. Uh, thank you, Eva. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Julio, and, and the whole team, of course, for convening this uh, this roundtable. I'm regretting I can't be there in person, but that's that's life. Um, I'll, uh, I've been asked to talk about FOIP, and I decided to look at the way it uh, managed to uh, add value to the regional uh, security environment uh, and maritime security. So I'll zoom out a little bit. And spoiler alert, I'll be much more optimistic, um, uh, at least in my introductory remarks. In fact, uh, while thinking about the title in the spirit of this festive season, I could go almost call it the miracle of FOIP. And I'm alluding here to the deeply transformative and uh, in fact, quite positive effect that FOIP has had on Japan in the first place, on the regional security architecture and on maritime security in general. To those who are not familiar with the FOIP, the acronym refers to the free and open Indo-Pacific vision concept that was first articulated by Prime Minister Abe in 2016 in Nairobi, in fact, during the Tokyo Conference on uh, African Development quoting the Indo-Pacific space as a space for freedom, the rule of law, market economy, free from force or coercion, um, which is the prerequisite for uh, regional prosperity. To note, and uh, Julio has already said that, uh, FOIP is not a formal strategy. It is really, uh, and it has never been, you know, uh, transposed into the institutional structure of the Japanese administration. It is a concept that has been guiding somehow the Japanese foreign policy for a while, but it is not in any way uh, a strategy. It is a, a rather landmark development for Japan, uh, because if you noticed, uh, the no notions of freedom and openness have been actually taken up, uh, not just by the US strategy, but uh, on, in most of the following uh, strategy, including the ASEAN outlook, including the European strategy. And it is a term that we continue uh, having completely interlinked now uh, with the Indo-Pacific nowadays. 
and it somehow uh, managed to create a common strategic narrative, common strategic umbrella for the involvement of all the extra regional powers in the Indo-Pacific. So politically, it is interesting because it managed to, to put Japan in a position of an agenda setter which is historically new to Japan, which as we know has been a, a rather reactive or passive player, and suddenly it becomes an agenda setter, a very much proactive uh, regional actor. And secondly, it also puts Japan at the very center uh, of the regional maritime security agenda as a sh major shaper of the agenda, and I'll get there. Miracle number two is the way that uh, FOIP and Japan has managed to actually bridge various elements in this new uh, redefined, fragmented uh, regional security environment. The focus of this vision is, is, is very balanced. It's not necessarily military focused as opposed to the US strategy. Uh, it's non-confrontative and it has a very a functional focus on connectivity, on economic prosperity, which has managed to seduce a number of very diverse regional partners within and outside the US alliance-based system. So in a way it became, or Japan in that sense, became an indispensable link uh, or glue of the regional security architecture. And we see this major upgrade in bilateral relationship with the US, of course, but also with India, with Australia, with the reciprocal uh, access agreement, uh, and at the same time with uh, a number of Southeast Asian countries. On minilaterals, uh, Japan has been actually the, the driving force uh, behind the revival of the Quad. That's something that should not be uh, forgotten. Uh, and of course, is a very close ally, uh, both with now Australia, US. So the uh, AUKUS formation is of course very much appealing to Japan and we already hear that it is willing to cooperate with AUKUS on technology, on artificial intelligence, uh, on quantum tech, etc. Now, Japan's interest in maritime security is definitely not a miracle. It is very much pragmatic. It is driven by core national security interests, its dependency on the slugs, and of course, uh, the wariness of Chinese uh, assertiveness, uh, as we could hear, including in, in its immediate neighborhood. So it's a national security concern. Uh, and, and what happens in maritime security, uh, we should not forget that it is are very much symptoms of uh, issues that are geopolitical, that are geoeconomic, and that have nothing necessarily closely to do with maritime security as such. So in, in, in that terms, uh, Japan's FOIP, if you want, is, 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 is a strategic calculus that worked, uh, that paid off. And uh, again, actually, we see this gluing effect because by being Japan and by having these inherently strategic concerns vis-a-vis -vis China, it seduces the alliance partners on the one hand, but on the other, it has this functional security uh, focus on marine domain awareness, on capacity building, on logistical uh, supply chains, etc., that are very much attractive to the non-aligned uh, partners uh, and, and the ones that are trying to be a little bit more neutral in, in, in the growing US-China rivalry. And I believe that this, um, in fact, maritime safety, domain awareness, capacity building is something that Japan has been doing way before uh, the FOIP, uh, quietly with Southeast Asia. It's something that, that marks the Japanese, um, it's, it's really the brand of Japan's approach to maritime uh, security. And frankly, when we think about the future um, uses of the Quad, for instance, that's where uh, I think we would lay, we would rely on. Uh, it's the coordination on logistics, it is the mutual access, it is maritime capacity building. So in a way, I think Japan is, is, is really this, uh, you know, leading and, and central and gluing actor of, of, of this all. Um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, replying to your question in the introductory blurb, to what extent we're witnessing a growing alignment in the Indo-Pacific maritime domain, if there is one glue, then it would be the FOIP, even if it's, you know, theoretically non-existent. The pending questions are, 
and uh, how sustainable it will be, given that Japan is clearly not a neutral uh, player uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this new um, strategic environment. And, and what can we do with the concept further? Will it be turned into a strategy? If yes, what impact it would be, uh, it would have. Um, normally, the new administration, as far as I know, is not uh, planning to revise the concept in any um, substantial way. But again, as I said, it's not a strategy, it's not coined down, so it remains for interpretation and it's probably a good thing. Thank you very much. I also thank you very much for uh, um, keeping in, uh, in time. We uh, look forward to uh, uh, Lindsay's uh, then uh, uh, analysis of how Sino-Japanese competition plays out in Southeast Asia, which of course is also connected to um, uh, to uh, uh, FOIP. Uh, Lindsay, the floor is yours. Thanks, Julia. Um, I know you're playing God, but I, I feel like I'm a bit like the Holy Ghost here because I've got the sun shining straight in my eyes, so I'm, I'm white, whiting up. Um, so keeping the Christmas theme, I suppose. Um, anyway, hopefully you can see me and hear me. Um, Not clear, yeah. Cool. Uh, so the question that was really driving um, my pitch um, builds off of what uh, Ava was just saying there. And I'm thinking about whether or not the regional visions of great powers are necessarily competitive. And I want to compare the EU-Russia case with the East Asian case. And I think that although rivalry can be observed in both, I want to argue that the distinct features of East Asian regionalism, particularly its loose nature and the integration of its economies, create a less threatening environment. And I also want to briefly, if I can, reflect on the EU's role, although maybe I'll skip that in view of uh, Christian's presentation and come back to it later. So starting with the EU-Russia case, Kadir has noted that um, both Russian and EU regional projects, so the Eurasian Economic Union in Russia's case and the Eastern Partnership in the EU case, started out as only geoeconomic competitive um, strategies, but negative perceptions on both sides due to historical antagonism, strategic concerns, among others, caused them to become geopolitical competitive projects. And this became a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, if you like. In a way, the EU-Russia case appears to provide a warning for what is unfolding in East Asia in terms of the competition between China and Japan. And indeed, writers such as yourself, uh, Julio, have mentioned the um, concerns about China's rise, its assertiveness, particularly in the East um, and South China Seas. Indeed, um, uh, Chisako Masuo mentioned that earlier in her presentation, but also Japan's decline, nationalism, historical grievances, territorial disputes, mutual distrust, all of this has played into and exacerbated a contemporary Sino-Japanese rivalry. We also see Japanese writers like Kei Koga who perceives the um, free and open Indo-Pacific as a containment policy towards China and the Belt and Road Initiative. So such accounts indicate that the regional visions of great powers are ultimately incompatible, competitive, malign, if you like. And yet there are others, such as um, Hosoya, uh, who perceive the free and open Indo-Pacific to have evolved to accommodate China's Belt and Road Initiative. And I think this is along the lines that Ava was just talking about just now. In addition, the FOIP has been repackaged to reassure ASEAN that they'll not have to pick sides between China, Japan, the US. Um, Chisako Masuo also notes that Japan's approach to China's Belt and Road Initiative has evolved, uh, notably in terms of its partnership for quality infrastructure, to shift from a confrontational a competitive approach to competitive cooperation. And this is not least due to Trump's America First policy that pressured allies and competitors alike and saw the US withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The Belt and Road Initiative is also evolving. Chinese policymakers are adapting the policy and responding 
to concerns about the BRI. So regional visions do evolve and they can do so in ways that are less threatening. As Deborah Brottingham notes, much of what has been written about China's debt trap diplomacy demonstrates a negativity bias and fails to dig deeper into what are complex but frequently successful and well-received development deals. On the other hand, China's development approach to Southeast Asia has also been critiqued. It was critiqued historically during the 1980s and has been since. The success of Japan's value-based diplomacy hides some less than savory developmental cases that have negatively impacted local residents, such as the Thilawa Special Economic Zone in Myanmar, or they've come with political ties attached, such as Japan financing for the Highway 5 in Cambodia. As Mary Soderbergh notes, China's approach to ODA is an adaptation of what it's learned from Japan. In this sense, Japan's ODA is a kind of soft power. Japan and China's development approach towards Southeast Asia are in many ways similar. I think when we compare the East Asian case with mounting EU-Russia tensions, notably in the Ukraine, we might also recognize that East Asian regionalism is rather different from regionalism in the, EU, in the EU. It has tended to be more open and less institutionalized than the EU. And this is part of the reason for the tensions between the EU and Russia. Delcourt argues that it was the EU's role as a regional builder as part of the Eastern Partnership that triggered Russia's counteractions. It was the threat of a deeper and closed form of integration that created contested and incompatible visions of regionalism. Now, East Asian regionalism has its skeptics. They deride it as a talk shop with few achievements, vague goals, aspirational rhetoric, and so forth. But we should be careful not to judge ASEAN-centric regionalism on EU terms. Proponents of East Asian regionalism, such as Amitav Achaya and Chinya Chin, argue that rather than pooling sovereignty and institutionalizing and legalizing cooperation, as in the European Union, East Asian states prefer to maintain their sovereign independence, cooperating on functional issues of interest, such as in the case of the Chiang Mai Initiative, to induce gradual changes. According to these scholars, the various regional fora enable East Asian states to maintain relations through dialogue and cooperation, whilst keeping in check overly ambitious efforts to formally integrate the region. Similarly, Breslin and Wilson emphasized possibilities for functional cooperation in East Asia. He attract two organizations, such as ASEAN uh, ISIS Network and the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific have been key to generating new policy ideas. The ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus since 2010, together with the East Asia Summit, have, provide, have become key security forums that include extra regional states, including the EU as an observer. And even though the security realm is often perceived in zero sum terms in East Asia, there's opportunities for cooperation. Japan's anti piracy efforts culminated in the establishment of the Regional Cooperation Agreement on Combating Piracy and Armed Robbery Against Ships in Asia, or RECAP. This demonstrates what can be achieved in terms of regional maritime security cooperation and the scope for expanding the recap, perhaps along the lines of the European Union's Maritime Analysis and Operations Center to enhance regional cooperation in the field of maritime domain awareness and regional responses to non-traditional security issues. This also ties into the work of Evelyn Goh and Alice Barr, who suggest that ASEAN's focus has been on the multi enmeshment of great powers through these regional groupings, but also, crucially, through economic processes. And I think these are things that we have to take into account. Any consideration of regional security tensions always needs to keep in mind the underlying focus of East Asian states on maintaining economic growth. Over time, international production networks have bound East Asian economies together, driving economic development. It's essential to appreciate the interplay of states and markets in the region. Through the BRI and FOIP, though they might be seen as two competing regional strategies, the infrastructure that both China and Japan are building further facilitate the movement of goods across the region. I wouldn't expect Chinese and Japanese firms to cooperate on specific infrastructure projects, at least not in the short term, 
and they're as, and they're as likely to compete as in the case of high-speed rail in Indonesia. But by recognizing the benefits of the BRI, albeit belatedly, the Abe administration signaled a willingness to develop infrastructure projects that were perhaps compatible with each other. The next step, as Bart Gaines, Shada Islam, and Yeole Huey indicate in a recent blog post, is to develop a connectivity code of conduct to ensure sustainability, transparency, and avoid geopolitical competition. This connectivity code of conduct should involve the World Bank, ADB, AIB, EU Investment Bank, European Bank for Reconstruction and Investment. And they argue ASEM may be a key forum in which key parties come together to negotiate this, the Asia-Europe meeting. Free trade agreements are a further area where we've seen increasing cooperation between East Asian states. In the 1990s and early 2000s, East Asian FTAs were lampooned for creating a noodle bowl of incompatible agreements that were more about politics than trade. But since East, Asians have East Asian states have recently signed these two big regional free trade agreements, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which includes the ASEAN plus three, so including Japan and China, together with Australia and New Zealand, and the Comprehensive Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP, which has been led by Japan, but now which China and uh, Taiwan would both like to join. Um, and though the, C the CPTPP goes further in terms of rules for intellectual property, labor, environmental issues, amongst others, both of these FTAs are WTO plus agreements that should increase regional trade and improve connectivity through IPNs, through international production networks. East Asian states are also cooperating on COVID vaccines, economic recovery, climate change, sustainable development. Like the EU, here we can think of the EU-Japan Economic Partnership, Asian states are doubling down on a rule-based multilateral order. The shared EU-East Asian commitment to multilateralism is something on which to build. Here we can think of Professor Anu Bradford's notion of a Brussels effect the ability to globalize the rules for the single market, including technolo technology uh, regulations, setting standards for trade, investment, infrastructure, and so forth. The EU has a role to play. I can say more about that, but I'll, I'll leave it for Chris to, to speak mostly on the EU um, role. But just to conclude, are regional visions of great powers necessarily competitive? I think the EU-Russia case suggests that they are, and similarities can be drawn with the East Asian case. That said, regional visions evolve, as does the geopolitical landscape in which states operate. Over the past couple of years, we've seen an improvement, at least rhetorically, in Sino-Japanese relations and policies towards Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia needs a massive injection of capital to build the infrastructure for its future. Both Japan and China can contribute to this, um, in complementary rather than competitive ways. And indeed, by signing the RCEP, Sino-Japanese commitment to the multilateral trade order can be observed. The loose nature of East Asian regionalism is designed to facilitate cooperation and mitigate tensions. Working through Track 2 forums, confidence measures, confidence building measures can be realized. The EU has a role to play in this too, perhaps as a mediator and a standard setter. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, for an uh, <clears throat> analysis that uh, goes uh, against the mainstream uh, uh, interpretations. Uh, we will come back to, um, to that um, uh, during um, a, um, my um, 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 summarizing of the pitches and, uh, and, and, and uh, my emphasis on some aspects uh, rather than uh, others to, 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 to keep the conversation going. I um, uh, think that uh, uh, the, um, we are ready then to uh, get to know really what is Europe's role and uh, what can Europe bring to, um, um, to the fore in, uh, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, through the Indo its Indo-Pacific approach. Uh, and of course, <clears throat> it all uh, uh, boils down uh, very often to uh, the preservation of uh, the international rules-based order. But what is an international rules-based order? What is a rules? Uh, whose rules as well? And uh, this is something that we will touch upon also uh, in the second session. Um, and uh, without further ado, the floor is yours, uh, Chris. Thank you very much, Julio, for the invitation and also 
host to the European University Institute for the invitation to participate in this event, uh, even though it's it's only online given the overall situation. Uh, I've titled my talk "In Search of the Rules-Based Order: Europe's Evolving uh, in the Pacific Approach," and um, in this way, I hope to answer your question, right? which was, uh, "What can and should Europe bring to the table of Indo-Pacific politics?" A question that's been asked uh, here in Europe quite often uh, that the European policymakers actually seem to ask their Japanese, uh, especially Australian counterparts. And uh, that obviously elicits various responses depending on who is being asked in what context. So my uh, my argument would, think, would be that the answer on this question, of course, depends on who else sits at the table or who should be sitting at the table in the Pacific politics. Uh, what game, if a game at all, is being played, and according to which rules this game is being played. So in other words, right, we need to know what the rules-based order is, and we need to know it, uh, this term, uh, we need to de define this term, uh, because it's so central in European policy papers and discourses, uh, not only in Europeans, but also, also I think in Australian, Japanese, and, and American discourse. Still, I think there's, there's a considerable ambiguity uh, about what it actually is. Uh, this is a problem because, after all, it should be describing what uh, policies are meant to preserve, to strengthen, or to promote. Um, if you look at the whole discourse, I think the, the only certain thing we can say is that there's, there's a consensus that Chinese action in the South China Sea, as adjudicated by the arbitration tribunal in 2016, are a breach or a threat or undermining this rules based order. That means the 9 F line claim, especially, and associated activities of uh, trying to claim natural resources in intrusive economic zones and uh, also uh, going after ships of other countries being used as Chinese claims. So, other than that, perhaps another intention is, or uh, kind of agreement is that the establishment of uh, Chinese sphere of influence or control over the waters and military terms inside the first island chain uh, is to be prevented and to scale back. I emphasize interest as a, as a, as a term and not values. So, given these ambiguities, I think ambiguities, we, we, there, there's a problem. Or the question is really, what what are policies doing? What happens? And uh, it seems to me that there's a major confusion actually about the direction of, of world politics or of regional politics, uh, given this inability to define what is to be preserved. And accordingly, of course, the outcomes of these policies will be quite different from the stated ones or even those who are intended but not stated as that. Uh, for the European side, I can here refer to the diagnosis of what the problems are, um, what the threats are. If you look at the different policy papers, the pioneered especially by the French government, but then also this very detailed German guidelines of the Indo-Pacific and then the EU uh, strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, it's quite clear that these Chinese actions in the South China Sea are seen as a problem. Perhaps additional ones, also additional Chinese actions according to Belt and Road Initiative or along the Belt and Road Initiative and so on. But at the same time, you have a clear view that China US rivalry is a destabilizing factor and that the EU has a major stake in the stability of the region and open sea. Um, now, how is how how are these European interests to be really preserved? And it seems that during the Trump administration, given the different policies that the administration had towards China, a very kind of containment directed policies, uh, policies towards its allies in East Asia, but also in Europe, and policies towards the institution of global government. Um, it seemed that uh, for the for you know in European eyes that Australia and Japan as two democratic middle powers of value partners would be uh, the countries to work with 
and it stabilizes the station and it's securing more for sea land. You can see that uh, now also um, at the case of Germany, which has been reluctant to really put uh, too much emphasis on this in the Pacific space in military terms, especially. Um, the frigate Bion has been crisscrossing uh, East Asia or the Indo Pacific. It's uh, going to arrive in Singapore soon, coming from Japan and Korea. Um, and what this journey or this mission tells us is that the security cooperation with Japan and Australia has been uh, the major focus. You can see that also in, in that we have now this uh, two plus two meetings between foreign and defense officials being set up with these two countries, which is uh, quite I think unusual for Germany. Um, so, but the question then is really how can stability be uh, assured by cooperating uh, with these two countries uh, and with this kind of ambiguous uh, notion of a rules based order in mind? And here I think it, it's, it's interesting and important to remember that especially German guidelines are quite. Uh, uh, clear in defining what the rules based order is. Um, they say that this is an order based on the United Nations Charter and related documents of the United Nations, including also, of course, those uh, who advance the protection of human rights, arms control, and the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So the question is, you know, how is this kind of rule-based order being advanced by uh, having a security political cooperation with uh, Australia and Japan, especially, but also of course with post-Trump US. And I think there's a major contradiction uh, within these these policies and discourses between uh, the emphasis on collective security on the one hand and uh, on cooperative security on the other. Obviously, uh, alliances themselves are not so much supporting what the German rules-based order definition uh, states. Uh, rather, they have that they, they produce different effects and have different uh, aims. And um, <clears throat> I think, in view of that, it would be very interesting or important to discuss what actually uh, policies that emphasize collective security. Uh, um, aim to achieve and how they want to stabilize the region. In other words, what is the rules based order really in, in this, if we go along this direction, and what does stability mean? And uh, <clears throat> if uh, the containment of China is, uh, if not rhetorically, but de facto, um, being seen as the answer, which I think is the case for many. Then the question is, of course, what is the view on, on how containment can stabilize the region? And I'm happy to discuss that, but I think it, it uh, provides an interesting uh, link back to what we have seen as or perceived as stability during times when Soviet Union was being contained. Um, obviously, that was a very different situation. It was very different times, but some of the uh, ways of thinking seem to be quite similar, and I'd be keen on uh, hearing those views back. So that's about my comments for now. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, it was uh, <clears throat> um, a very comprehensive uh, first round, uh, which uh, we touched upon, and um, I think what is interesting <clears throat> uh, from uh, uh, our presentations, probably one of the first few instances uh, in uh, uh, a panel dedicated to the Indo-Pacific is that we haven't really focused on the United States of America much, um, which of course is um, then <clears throat> um, directly uh, related to um, also the posturing and the jostling of all of these actors we've, uh, we have explored. Um, and so my question to all of you is, um, uh, how is China responding uh, and to uh, the United States uh, pushback? Um, how about Japan? Uh, according to an anonymous uh, Japanese government official um, who has rat written an, an article um, in uh, 2020 in the American interest, um, 
uh, the Abe administration has seen benefits uh, uh, on uh, a US pushback against uh, China under Trump. Um, is this still the case under the new Kishida government? Was that the case under the Abe administration? Um, and what about European players? Uh, uh, and what about Southeast Asian players? How do they understand uh, US-China competition and uh, the US uh, posturing? And then <clears throat> I would like to ask you an even broader question, which you can address uh, 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 before. So, you know, the US role and how uh, regional players see it, uh, the ones you focus for your presentation. And the question I have is directly related to um, Lindsay's presentation. Lindsay's presentation was quite provocative and uh, um, uh, very, uh, very welcome because it's good to have uh, uh, discussion, and which is the reason why uh, we have diversity and inclusivity also in terms of, uh, of ideas uh, at, the U, uh, at the European University Institute. And um, I think it's uh, uh, noteworthy, of course, uh, that uh, Lindsay has uh, emphasized uh, economic aspects. And the key difference I can think of is that, of course, uh, differently from Russia, which has uh, the economy, uh, which, whose economy is the size of uh, uh, South Korea or Spain, China's economy is, is, is the second largest and it's rapidly growing and it's in the neighborhood, right? So um, uh, these uh, neighboring countries benefit from China's rise economically and also uh, will find uh, an economic giant which will never move, you know, will, will never <clears throat> change neighborhood. It's always going to be there. And so how does that affect then the calculus uh, of these players, which I imagine is particularly important? Even if uh, say, said uh, cooperative behavior is uh, superficial, and I can think of uh, uh, some regional players uh, rhetorically emphasizing uh, uh, complementarities and inclusivity, uh, also for the sake of preserving a modicum of stability with what is a, a, giant, uh, a giant player. And this brings me then to the question I ask to all of you guys. Mm. Since, of course, uh, what we study uh, drives also uh, our uh, uh, analysis, and if you focus on security, you will emphasize security uh, components and security, uh, the security dilemma that is also at play uh, in, uh, in, the Asia, uh, in the Asian landscape, which is, of course, almost schizophrenic. What do you see? Uh, you see more competitive uh, dynamics or more cooperative dynamics? Uh, and if you see both, uh, what do you think uh, will uh, play out more in what are very turbulent and transitionary times? So <clears throat> US-China competition and, uh, and cooperative and competitive dynamics uh, 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 in the region. And last but not least, um, uh, I, um, I'm very curious about uh, the role of personality. And this is a question specific to uh, uh, Chisako and, uh, and, and Eva and to whomever wants to pick it. Uh, you emphasized in your presentation, Chisako, that of course the policy vision of the leader uh, plays a big role in setting also the key direction of, uh, of transit. And it looks like Xi Jinping is a more risk prone, uh, less risk averse uh, leader. Um, what is his role, if you can see, you know, through the bamboo curtain, which is what we're getting more and more in the new Cold War, what is uh, Xi Jinping's role um, in maritime security, if at all? Uh, there has been a key reorganizational process, uh, as you mentioned, uh, in the maritime agenda. Uh, the Coast Guard is effectively now part of, uh, if I'm not mistaken, of the People's Armed Police and the Central Military Commission that Xi Jinping chairs. But... If you, give us, if you can give us more about his role, it'd be very, very interesting. And conversely, Eva, what about uh, um, Kishida's role? Because <clears throat> the free and open Indo-Pacific really, as I see it and as I understand it, was a byproduct of, of Team Abe, um, dating back from the first Abe administration. Um, Kanehara was at the Foreign Policy Bureau and uh, his um, uh, fellow diplomat, uh, um, who penned the free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, I think his name is Ishikawa, uh, was also at the Foreign Policy Bureau, and he would eventually be in Kanehara's position during the second Abe administration. So these people are Abe's people, 
Um, Yachi, of course, was also important. He was in power uh, and influential during the first and second Abe administrations. But what about the Kishida government? Will there be a new redefinition of a free and open Indo-Pacific? Because I guess that personality uh, matters more and more uh, at turbulent times and giving an imprint into these initiatives. Um, and yes, I guess uh, I'll leave it at that. I have uh, many more questions and comments, but uh, I'll leave it at that. And then uh, after a second round, I will give you at most five minutes, um, we will have uh, a Q&A. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, feel free also to discuss uh, ideas and uh, propositions from your fellow panelists. And uh, I guess it's okay to go in uh, uh, the same order we've started with. Okay, so Chisa, if Uh, well, uh, thank you, Julia, for uh, your uh, wonderful three difficult questions <laughs> uh, regarding um, uh, the, the U.S. role um, in uh, the Asia Pacific. Of course, um, uh, its role is very important, uh, and uh, well, uh, China tends to uh, focus much more on the bigger countries. So basically, uh, in Chinese understanding, uh, what they're doing is the response to the United States. Uh, it's not paying very close attention to other countries. But recently, of course, uh, there are Australia, India, and also Japan are go uh, seem to be uh, going against uh, China. So, uh, but China tends to understand that those actions are not decided by those countries themselves, but it's rather uh, a part of uh, conspiracy policy uh, made by the United States, which is not true. Uh, those countries actually take uh, those actions and uh, make their own decisions, but uh, depending uh, uh, based on their own interests. So uh, I think uh, that's a big mistake uh, uh, Chinese government is uh, making. But anyhow, um, Yes, so uh, I think uh, U.S. Uh, plays a very big role. And um, last year, uh, when Trump administration were attacking China on, especially on its uh, IT uh, industry, that gave a huge impact on China's perception. Uh, China was uh, well, the leaders of chi uh, China uh, felt that they were their survival was at stake uh, during that period. So uh, that's when uh, they started to create very big new programs to go against uh, the United States because that's for uh, the Chinese, China's survival. That's their understanding. So uh, the second question, um, uh, well, um, I was somebody um, who was hoping that uh, we could divide politics and economy mm -hmm. somehow and make balance between the two, two uh, fe different fields until recently. But um, I don't think uh, that's a very possible option right now. Uh, I was very fortunate to be able to spend uh, six months in total in, uh, in China in uh, two years ago, to 2019. I was at, uh, uh, first I was at uh, CAS, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and then I moved to uh, uh, the, univer uh, what, what do they call, uh, the University uh, of Diplomacy mm -hmm. there. Um, uh, when I was at CAS, uh, I uh, could meet many uh, economic experts in China who were uh, you know, writing many reports to the government, uh, to, basically to the state council. But uh, I could observe their perceptional change, uh, which was very sad for me. <laughs> well, um, they really want, uh, they were, at first, they were very uh, interested in uh, Japan's uh, old uh, experiences when we had this trade war with uh, trade uh, conflicts with the United States. And uh, during those periods of uh, 
uh, our former Prime Minister Fukuda was a very popular figure in China. He visited China many times, and uh, he, he tried to persuade the Chinese counterparts to use this opportunity to upgrade the level of its uh, domestic economy. So uh, I could see many, uh, uh, many of my ch Chinese colleagues were uh, trying to, you know, use their brains to uh, make it come true. However, because of, uh, because of uh, Trump administration's attack had been continuing so much, uh, they gradually st started to realize that not an possible option for China anymore. And uh, those people were also criticized by many other uh, experts and probably perhaps leaders in China who are more um, who uh, put more emphasis on politics, you know, the rival rivalry with the United States. So gradually those people uh, lost influence in China. Uh, but they, but if you think about, you know, the economic cooperation with Japan and China, uh, they're the ones who all, always try to cooperate with other countries. And when uh, Japanese ex experts and businessmen uh, uh, communicate with them, uh, they basically do not have you know, much differences in ideas. So they, can, they are the ones who can cooperate. On Japanese side, uh, probably starting this year um, or, or after the COVID anyway, uh, I think uh, Japanese businessmen and also the economic experts are all also having the same type of perception or change. Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, well, uh, after the COVID, Xi Jinping started to take over the economic initiative in China. So he started to control, well, it, well, of course he was uh, fearing, he was very afraid of the United States. So he tried to uh, dominate uh, the private economy of China and then try to uh, consolidate the economic power of China in his hands, but that really uh, affected uh, the Japanese perception on China because a uh, private economy was something uh, we were always cooperating. So uh, there, the win-win situation uh, was there, and that's something we've had for so many decades. But now, uh, Xi Jinping started to destroy that situation. So uh, there are many Japanese uh, econ economic experts who are losing the hope to, uh, for continuing a cooperation with China in, uh, in future. So, that, so I will uh, uh, stop very short, in a very short time. Role of personality. Yes, um, Xi Jinping is a very special leader. I think uh, we China specialists will uh, have to study him a lot in future. Um, well, uh, he, uh, in terms of the maritime uh, security, he thinks he's an expert because uh, he has spent uh, almost a quarter of the uh, century in uh, Fujian and Zhejiang provinces, uh, which are the big, a very big uh, fishery uh, provinces in China. And uh, during those periods, uh, he has interviewed many uh, fishermen as well. And uh, he tried, and he, when he was in Fujian province, he was also, uh, he also dealt with many Taiwanese business people as well. So he thinks he's the very uh, experts um, of maritime issues in China. So, um, but during the uh, Fu Jintao period, uh, the maritime decision makers in China were very dispersed and nobody could control uh, anyone. Uh, Hu Jintao wasn't con able to, he, he, Hu Jintao wasn't controlling, for example, uh, uh, state oceanic administration. Uh, when, uh, so uh, they, for example, they made the first, when they made uh, the first intrusion to the territorial water of Senkakus, uh, they didn't even have the uh, permission from the central authority at all. So Hu, uh, Xi Jinping thinks that's a huge problem in China. So what's he, what he has been doing uh, after he became the general secretary of China is that he has been trying to consolidate all the powers and decision-making process in his hand. So, uh, and he's been very um, capable in doing it. Uh, he's a very special and unique leader that has, uh, who has a very, uh, um, very unique philosophy and uh, he's the one who can actually implement 
his philosophy. Very scary. You know? <laughs> that's my um, understanding. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Eva, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Julio. Well, I didn't mention the US-China rivalry because I assumed that everyone else will be talking about it as it's, you know, the, the usual leitmotif of any maritime security debate uh, in the region. But of course, that's, that's the alpha and omega of uh, what's going on and why we are even convening uh, most of these, uh, most of these you know, actions. Uh, as Lindsay said, I mean, everything is not really that rosy. Uh, you know, if we would just compare uh, you know, competing connectivities and whatever, then we're on the good side. Um, but unfortunately, it's not. So even if, according to Lindsay's theory, uh, the region is much more inclusive and much more prone to cooperation and in, you know, according to different standards, but everything is fine. Then if there is one thing that really exacerbates uh, the, the, the region, it is the, the US-China rivalry, right? And, and that is here to stay. Um, without necessarily one that doesn't need to be a, a China expert uh, to know what, what China thinks about the US uh, pushback, it is ultimately perceived as unfair. Uh, you know, all sorts of partnerships uh, and, and, and initiatives, whether economic ones or military ones, especially the military ones, are aimed at its containment and therefore China needs to uh, build up its capabilities, you know, very kind of simply put uh, to, to be uh, a, a proper partner, to be uh, on pair with, uh, with, um, with the US. So we're talking about this G2 uh, narrative. So ultimately and that's kind of a little bit leading to what you, your question about she's role in maritime security if what the the aim is to achieve the china dream then the china dream also passes through uh assuming a certain maritime role uh i'm not saying that uh, you know xi jinping is a fan of Mackinder, but i mean the the whole maritime expansion has been predicted by most strategists um, already you know, decades, uh, decades ago, and we're definitely leading there. The question is according to what rules of behavior, behavior it, will be, it will be playing. So uh, we know that by 2050, uh, China will have probably all the military and naval capabilities, um, you know, uh, will be a top uh, naval uh, power. We know that, uh, you know, it, it will have, it already has the blue water capabilities it wanted to have. The question is whether it will manage to kind of, you know, stay within the rules um, that we define. And here we're back to the question of who's rails-based order. And I, I must say that I found the question of whose rules a little bit intriguing when we <laughs> talk about maritime security, because at sea, uh, until further notice, to me, the rules-based order is UNCLOS. Uh, and we can have this more, uh, you know, hypothetical uh, philosophical debate on, on the, the general terms of, of whose rules matter, but at sea, still in the sort of order, international order that we're living by, it is UNCLOS. And as Christian said, yes, that one um, element that we agree on in that sense would be China disrespecting the 2016 PCA ruling, but there is of course more. So, um, so that's just uh, on, on the rules-based order. Um, Chinese, uh, whether we see a competitive or cooperative dynamic, definitely I would say a mix of both. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you know all of the regional strategies in Japan. Um, ASEAN, as you said, depend on, uh, on China. So the, the, the effort to continue cooperating with China is, is definitely there. Um, but we cannot uh, simply close our eyes um, in front of the, the, the situation in the South China Sea or in the East China Sea or in the Straits of Taiwan. So, you know, while we can be cooperating on loads of issues and I'm quite positive on, 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 on this, you know, competitive, uh, kind of rather positive competition in terms of connectivity, infrastructure, investments, and whatever, which can really drive um, Southeast Asia, Asian, or South Asian, or African development to a certain extent, uh, and that's healthy. Uh, things will inevitably clash when um, you know the troubles hit the fan. 
and 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 that's really what uh, what Chisako's uh, some at least partly what Chisako's presentation was about. Let's not forget it's not just the Coast Guard uh, Coast Guard law. There's also the maritime safety law that was uh, enforced uh, in September this year, and which is pretty much promoting a similar. Uh, logic, you know, enforcing uh, within um, the waters under Chinese jurisdiction uh, a compulsory pilotage system and the capacity to interpel foreign vessels, etc. So, um, I mean, this is this is really a debate of you know China starting with a finger and then eventually advancing uh, and, and taking the whole uh, the whole hand, the whole arm, um, which are yeah features of the, of the of the regional security environment that we cannot simply ignore. So it will be definitely a, a mix of both. Uh, Kishida will continue uh, normally, at least based on my conversations with uh, people close to the current administration. Kishida has no intention to reform, uh, revise the FOIP, neither to turn it uh, into a national security strategy for the moment. Um, now, it's true that the, the current security strategy dates from 2013, so, um, you know, ultimately within some, you know, kind of not too near, but not too distant future, we may see some sort of revision and there will be elements of void, but for now there is a, it's, it's a kind of constant um, cruise uh, speed. But we do see, of course, uh, um, that's, I mean, if it would be turned into a security strategy, I think it would be beneficial, at least from that. It would allow a greater operationalization of it. And that's, that's one of the problems, right? So you see a rhetoric, you see headlines about Japan, uh, you know, getting harder on uh, or planning, uh, having contingency planning in, in the Taiwan Straits, for instance, but it remains uh, a mostly rhetorical debate. It remains a political debate because there is no, for now at least, an institutional backing, uh, partly also uh, because of the absence of a firm strategy on this. So I believe that there is, yeah, cruise mode still keeping the direction of FOIP, which is quite vague, um, but at the same time, hopefully getting um, a little bit more firm uh, and action oriented. Uh, when it comes to the defense of its maritime interests. So East China Sea, Taiwan Strait, probably much more uh, closer defense cooperation with, it, with its allies. I mentioned India, Australia, uh, US, of course, within the Quad, while keeping the moderating tone. But yeah, much closer cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Lindsay, you uh, want to uh, respond to uh, sure. questions and uh, others' comments? Thank you. Sure, thanks. Um, I really didn't think what I was saying was provocative, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but okay. Um, but maybe it's how it's come across. I mean, I certainly don't think that everything is fine in the East Asian region. Not at all. I think that there are competitive, and cooperative dynamics, right? There's a tendency, I think, within the field of international relations, particularly when we talk about security, to hone in on the competitive without about the possibilities for cooperation within regional frameworks in East Asia. And I also think within the field of international relations as a discipline, particularly when we talk about security dynamics, we separate security from economics. I don't think you can do that. I certainly don't think you can do that in the East Asian region. The two are so intertwined. When you look, if you Google, um, you know, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, free and open Indo-Pacific, you'll get a little PowerPoint um, of what the free and Indo-Pacific means in four PowerPoint slides according to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And it's clear that this is, you know, yes, there are security concerns, but a lot of the focus is on the economic relations. The key area that I'm focusing on at the moment is on Japan-Myanmar relations. And that particularly encompasses the uh, East, West and Southern corridors that go straight across the Mekong subregion. And the argument goes that these are in competition with the north-south economic corridor that flows to China. And I've never really understood why they are necessarily in competition with one another. 
Because when I think about the production networks that are situated around that area, they're all gonna make use of this infrastructure. It's complementary as far as I can see. Perhaps, you know, it creates this dynamic of, of sucking trade in a particular direction, but I think it just opens up opportunity. When it comes to looking at how East Asian or Southeast Asian countries see things, I think that's what they're looking at. They're looking at the opportunities that derive from, you know, China and Japan, both providing these infrastructure opportunities, but now increasingly the European Union, the United States and its allies providing these infrastructure opportunities. Wonderful. You know, we get to pick the best, uh, we get to pick the best option, you know. So they're looking for economic growth, they're looking for economic opportunities, they want to continue the good times, they don't want to pick sides between the United States and China. But I think that Southeast Asian states are also looking for a balance militarily against Chinese assertiveness, particularly in the South China Sea. So they very much welcome a US military presence, but it doesn't stop there, right? Um, when we think about the role of the United States in the region, I think the question has to be which one, which United States are we talking about, Democratic or Republican? In many respects, Biden has followed Trump with an America first policy, but the, the emphasis is different, right? And I think that, you know, the Trump years were years in which you could feel that stability ebbing away. I think it's what pushed the Abe administration away from this competitive approach towards the Belt and Road Initiative, towards a more sort of complementary approach, towards more embracing it. It certainly created the impetus for moving forward with the regional cooperation, uh, sorry, the regional comprehensive economic partnership, RCEP in Japan, there's a sense that, you know, if, you know, we can we really rely on the United States? The age old question of, you know, will the United States abandon the region? Um, I think that, you know, the, the, the question of the rule of law and, and the rule based order is one that we do have to, to look at. There was an interesting book by Rosemary Foote and oh, something Walters, I can't remember his name, but on um, China and the United States and the global order, and essentially trying to ascertain which one of these states abided more by the global order. This was written in 2010, and maybe we need an updated version of this, but their conclusion was China abides much more by the rules of the global order than the United States has ever done. I mean, we're talking about UNCLOS as the key to the rule-based order in the Indo-Pacific. Ask any Chinese analyst, the first thing they'll say is, well, the United States never signed that, right? And you hear now from experts in, in Washington that this is one of the things that the United States should be doing, if only to shut up Chinese analysts that keep berating uh, the United States for not signing UNCLOS. But it doesn't take too much digging to look at countries who are expounding this FOIP rhetoric of free and open and rules-based order, not living up to the tenets of that order. Look at Japan and Okinotorishima. What is the difference between Okinotorishima and the islands we're talking about in the South China Sea? You know, nothing <laughs> as far as I can see. And yet Japan is an exponent of the rule-based order China isn't. Um, Gupta recently wrote a blog post on India not living up to UNCLOS in the Indian Ocean. So with any of these actors, you can question the extent to which they abide, they truly abide by a rule-based order. One thing that always gets me is the sort of universal values that get tapped on to this rule-based order of freedom, democracy, human rights, none of which is lived up to, none of which is the focus. It just provides the, 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 
legitimacy, if you like, the rhetorical legitimacy behind that rules-based order. So I think it is, it is important to question that. It is a question important to question what we're talking about and how we conceptually define um, what this order is. Um, I'll leave it at that. I think there's plenty more to say, but uh, I think I've probably spoken for long enough. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, we have uh, Chris's uh, responses, and uh, I encourage everybody, including those here in the room, to, to participate uh, and join the conversations with questions, comments. And so, uh, uh, without further ado, Chris, the floor is yours, and then we'll have uh, a uh, lively, uh, hopefully, debate with uh, our online and in presence participants. Yeah, maybe I can just start by adding, uh, building up what uh, Lindsay mentioned or said about the rules based on in, in, in the maritime sphere. I would also think that it should be, in this aspect, it should be one of the clearest instances of where we can say you unclose is the order, right? And you have to follow this. Um, and of course, then China didn't follow, especially when it comes to the nine dash claim and all these points in the arbitration award. That is the case, right? But uh, uh, the entire thing is not that clear when we go a bit look uh, closer into it. Um, that's because legally uh, there are different aspects and in terms of policies, there's also different aspects. And then of course, there's the, the big issue of geopolitics coming on top of it, uh, which complicated things. And uh, I think um, to make these points is, uh, is not about, um, belittling or relativating the Chinese actions. I think that they, they must be seen in the way they are in absolute terms, right? It, it's not possible, it, it's uh, not justified that China seeks to control the South China Sea. Um, but if, and that's my take, right? If we really want to strengthen these rules, we have to focus on the rules themselves. And all actors have, you know, in, in one way or in general, have to adhere, adhere, adhere to these rules. And it can't be just that, uh, you know, uh, because of China not adhering to these rules that everybody else can basically do many different things and, and it goes unchallenged because then we lose the focus on what the rules are, the rules that are there for everybody. And, uh, and that's actually a role in the system. And in terms of the maritime uh, aspect, of course, on UNCLOS, we have this issue about freedom of navigation, which has been disputed in legal terms, what can be done with military vessels within the exclusive economic zones, where you have basically everybody except maybe Japan. Uh, Japan is following the rules, it seems, as far as I know, but everybody else is saying, oh, well, um, um, either you can't do military surveillance in exclusive economic zones, but does it in other, other countries exclusive, exclusive economic zones? Or, for instance, the U.S. in Australia say, "Well, you can't, you can do it," and then it also allows uh, Chinese vessels to do it explicitly. But if uh, you see what happens when the Chinese do it, there's a huge uproar in, in the strategic studies community of these countries, and the threat perceptions clearly increase. So uh, that's even in this basic uh, aspect, you have you have uh, very different many differences. Then, of course, there's the question of territorial disputes and claims which are quite different and where you have, even within the South China Sea, right, even still, especially for instance, Philippines and Malaysia are having strong disputes that really inhibited solutions as well, including a common stance towards China. Uh, and then of course you have other things like, uh, as mentioned, the, the qualification of what an island is. And I think most countries who have these rocks and they use them to draw exclusive economic zones around them, even with these rocks. So, and, that's that's one thing, and and the other thing is, it seems that I'm a bit more pessimistic than most. Uh, I, in a way, I'm a realist. I think, even though I'm not using the theories, because for the past fifteen years that I've been studying East Asian politics, things have constantly got worse. I think, and there's always people saying, "Well, it's not so bad." You know, I you know, this is just uh, it's just two rocks and kakodiari. This is going to be fixed. You know, nobody's going to make war about this. And, Everybody knows this, you know, we're just cooperating and we have competition and it's all fine. But it's constantly getting worse if you look at military postures and if you look at uh, how things develop in terms of uh, domestic politics, because, you know, how there's, there's a backlash because uh, domestic politics or national security uh, engulfs more and more areas. And given that trend, I really ask myself, you know, 
aren't we seeing a security dilemma? And isn't it just the people who are involved in security dilemma that you know don't want to see it because of course it's just the other the other actor's fault. So it's not my fault. We are not in a dilemma, it's <laughs> just you. And whether this is I'm not sure whether people agree with this view and in what aspect, then but that would be interesting to debate, and especially because we have China on one side and uh, the US plus Japan on the other side. So it's not very clear that you have two actors only, uh, you know, clashing, but you have uh, other, you know, other actors, especially surrounding the US with different you know, policies. And in that sense, I'm, I'm also, uh, even from the statements that were made today, I'm, I'm quite intrigued, or I find it interesting that there seems to be no um, agreement on whether, you know, there is a China containment or not. And, uh, that seems quite uh, worrying because in case there is, you know, most of the perhaps more liberal views or observers will miss it. And then five years later, they will be surprised that, oh, well, China is doing that. You know, how can they do it? You know, they're so aggressive. And of course, the Chinese will do the same from their point of view. And, and this is how the situation will escalate. So that's uh, my thought so far. And I really try to want to push you to think more about what stability is and whether we have a security dilemma. Uh, or whether we have a containment policy, uh, not necessarily from the Chinese view, but also from the other uh, point of view. Thank you, Chris. Um, we uh, would like to then open up the floor for discussion. One thing that I get uh, uh, from um, these, uh, some of the second round that we haven't really spelled out also because our focus is on maritime security and, mar and maritime order is that um, clearly <clears throat> there is a blurring also uh, between the economic and security uh, uh, fields, also because of the very moment we are living. We haven't mentioned that we are at the cusp at the uh, dawn of the fourth industrial revolution. And of course, um, technological innovation um, uh, is going to favor um, uh, those at the forefront uh, of uh, uh, of innovation and, and uh, that is not going to just be an economic uh, um, 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 benefit uh, in terms of uh, market share and uh, setting the standards, but also uh, a strategic and military one, because of course, if uh, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and some of the technology that you, that you Chisako, has, have also mentioned, uh, they're going to also be double uh, dual use, uh, pretty much like uh, electricity was uh, during uh, uh, previous industrial revolutions. And so there is a, a technological uh, uh, slash uh, security uh, dimension also at play, that is um, <clears throat> clearly also further blurring uh, the distinction between uh, politics and economics. And so that's why there is uh, growing awareness of economic security, we haven't mentioned. Um, there is an economic security minister in Japan. Um, of course, these measures sometimes are couched in the language of security, but uh, they mean something else, right? It's industrial policy, policy it's protectionism, but there are competitive uh, elements at, uh, there as well. And uh, this is also to make clear where I stand, I guess, uh, in this conversation, <laughs> clearly on the more cynical uh, and, 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 and worried side as well. Um, <clears throat> and this, of course, is replicated uh, uh, not just in the US, uh, but also in China with uh, the whole dual circulation uh, strategy, which is also aimed at, uh, at uh, uh, lifting up barriers, and they were already pretty high uh, uh, in, in the People's Republic of China. I, I don't want to uh, blab uh, longer. I had questions on lawfare and competing sovereignties of law, but uh, I think uh, it would be uh, beneficial uh, to continue this conversation for 20 more minutes. Uh, and perhaps uh, if we have floors uh, from uh, 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 somebody here, yeah, we have one question. And I encourage uh, online participants to raise their hands and uh, Without further ado, uh, Peng Hang, the floor is yours. Uh, remember to switch on uh, the mic, please. Yes, uh, I have a question for, for Chisako. And uh, uh, the first is about, uh, as we learned, the RCEP will take effect in next year, 
so what is Japanese uh, mainstream people's opinion on this RCEP? And what's more, uh, because of the integration of this region, like it's the first uh, free trade agreement for Korea, China, and Japan. Uh, how will it affect on the marine time security issue? Will they uh, release the tension among this country? Uh, thank you very much for your uh, interesting question. Uh, I haven't paid uh, close attention to this issue, uh, but I would like to introduce you uh, what is our uh, uh, daily uh, consensus on this issue. Um, RCEP, um, uh, yes, uh, that's a, a big uh, agreement we have uh, reached recently, but uh, many people have argued that, uh, well, uh, uh, the biggest beneficiary will be China. Uh, and comparing to the CCTPP, uh, its level of uh, uh, economic co uh, the, the level of, um, uh, how do you say, a free trade agreement is much lower. And so even though uh, that might uh, make uh, many procedures more convenient for the participants, uh, I don't think uh, people are debating that it will uh, change the uh, horizon of uh, Japanese uh, cooperation with the regional uh, economies. And uh, obviously uh, there is a big problem. India decided not to participate in the RCEP. So that's a big, uh, disappointment from the Japanese side. Um, and uh, I don't think um, there is a debate that uh, uh, there's a perception that it, th this also relates to the maritime security so far. Uh, I don't think uh, because of the low degree of it, its cooperation, uh, I don't think it can loosen the tension between the do, those countries. Rather, um, people are more afraid that the Xi Jinping might use this uh, as a new tool to influence us. You know, starting from last year, he has been mentioning that uh, he should use uh, this economic leverage uh, to influence other uh, countries, uh, not uh, particularly on the RCEP, but uh, generally saying, and uh, he has been mentioning that the market should be controlled by the party uh, domestically. So that means uh, he can also do the same to, toward other uh, countries too. So uh, we are paying very close attention to his uh, economic policy. Uh, Li Keqiang has been losing his influence and now uh, he's been, uh, of course uh, Liu He is still there, uh, but uh, it seems like uh, Xi Jinping is trying to extend his control over many economic realms. So uh, I think uh, many Japanese people are more worried about uh, economic uh, uh, increased economic cooperation with China at this moment. Thank you. Does anybody want to add something on uh, this question of RCEP and uh, uh, the potential for uh, Japan, ROK, China uh, cooperation, or even the prospects for uh, a trilateral uh, free trade agreement between these three economies? Uh, I think, yeah, Chris, you're like approaching the camera. Uh, you are, you're muted, Chris. You're muted, Chris. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. That uh, hasn't happened for a long time. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I've been doing research on, on this trilateral cooperation in Northeast Asia before, and uh, I always think that I'm between South Korea, China, and Japan, which seems very significant to me. And even though there's not much outcome in terms of, you know, there's a lot of talking and, and some meetings and it really seems very important to me because it, it really helps to keep uh, things together uh, to some extent. And, and as such, I would also say that I think that this very big uh, um, agreement, a free trade agreement helps. Uh, not that trade and economic interdependence will really fix the political relations, right? We have seen that if this wasn't happening over the last decade or so at all. It didn't help, right? If politics, politics comes always first and politics will destroy the economic links as we've seen now in the past few years. 
but it really helps to create an alternate in, in that it says, you know, look, it's not just uh, about military stuff that matters, and, it, and then also there are some sort of alternate order that, that, that can be envisioned in terms of the, the region itself. Thank you. I don't see hands raised. Oh, yeah, no, there you go. I see a big hand. Yes, please, Lindsay. Um, it was just that it was near the camera. It's not really a big hand. Um, I think I would add to it that, you know, look at China's trajectory over the past three, four decades. Look at its incredible rise. It's, it's whether you welcome it or not, it's impressive. The, the sort of um, the, the tensions, the, the, the uh, challenges that, that China has been able to get through. You would not have predicted China's rise, I think, in the early 1990s um, when Deng Xiaoping was fighting conservatives within his party on whether or not China should maintain the same, same direction. Today, Look at the challenges, the domestic challenges that China faces, whether it's energy shortages or the housing market, you know, there's so much that, that, that China has to deal with on a domestic level. And we often miss that as well if in, in international relations. We, we, we don't appreciate how China uses the international to reflect what really is the focus, which is domestic. And the primary focus domestically is economic growth. It always has been for the past three decades. It's not the only thing that matters, but uh, you know, when you think about something like RCEP, it's about what does it mean for the Chinese economy? What does it mean for Chinese businesses? What does it mean for Chinese employment? That's what keeps the party primarily stable. And then I would say secondarily, it's things like nationalism, and that's where you use you know, territorial disputes to, to play up nationalism and get people over the, the difficult times they may be suffering because of whatever is going on economically. So I think I would never predict the next five years of China. I wouldn't try to do that. You just don't know what the next problem China has to deal with will be. None of us saw this COVID crisis coming, you know, 12, 13 years ago, none of us saw the global financial crisis coming. You know, we shouldn't be making predictions about what, you can say, you know, a certain trajectory will lead China in a certain direction or lead the region in a certain direction, but it's, it's too unpredictable. Thank you, thank you. I will jump on a, a recent, uh, on a comment you made about, uh, uh, emphasis on uh, seemingly international initiatives uh, that have actually a domestic relevance and um, uh, prioritization to ask a question instead on uh, seemingly domestic initiatives that have international impact and this question is for our distinguished maritime experts uh, uh, Chisako and Eva. Um, um, uh, it has been claimed of course that China engages into so-called lawfare uh, with regards to the use and abuse of international and to a, a bigger extent, uh, domestic laws uh, for the purpose also of coercive uh, intimidation sometimes. So there is an effect that the uh, Coast Guard law and the uh, maritime safety law have also vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis China's neighbors. Uh, is that the case? How have... Uh, mm, uh, Japanese fishermen uh, uh, also re responded to China's assertiveness in the East China Sea. Um, I have I remember reading uh, uh, articles uh, two years ago, <clears throat> according to which the government has actually asked for restraint on Japanese fishermen for the sake of avoiding a crisis and uh, and and also, um, uh, in a sense, getting in. Uh, 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 in danger. This suggests that this salami slicing uh, tactics on the Chinese side uh, do elicit an effect. Is that the case? 
Uh, what about other uh, uh, neighbors, maritime neighbor, littoral states uh, in the uh, uh, South China Sea? Do you see um, these, uh, not just China's uh, assertiveness, but these laws, these uh, seemingly domestic laws, eliciting an effect internationally, Eva? Do you, do you see a, a, an effect? And so this question is, is for you, um, because it is a broader question. Uh, it, it speaks to a broader question, but is that uh, when we talk about the rules-based order, <clears throat> what is interesting is that we are seeing more and more a problem with competing sovereignties of law, uh, meaning that domestic laws uh, um, are really going against the grain of international uh, um, uh, agreed uh, rules. This has been the case with uh, also in uh, our continent, it has been the case, uh, uh, and this is, uh, uh, is well above uh, uh, maritime security, but the German Supreme Court essentially <clears throat> uh, going against the ruling by European bodies and essentially delegating the decision uh, ultimately to uh, the German Central Bank. So in a sense, it claims that there, there is a, sub a superiority, uh, a hierarchy, whereas the domestic law supersedes international uh, uh, European uh, laws. This has been the case also in the, um, in the spat between Japan and South Korea over forced labor, whereas essentially um, the Supreme Court in South Korea has uh, uh, <clears throat> gone against what is understood as uh, um, an international treaty, the 1965 treaty between Japan and South Korea, regulating bilateral relations and compensation claims. And this seems to be the case also with these uh, Chinese initiatives, um, <clears throat> uh, but in a sense, so speak to a competing sovereignty of law, whereas the domestic uh, supersedes uh, the international. Uh, is that the case? Um, or has Chinese uh, interpretation of UNCLOS uh, been always consistent? Uh, uh, because it looks like uh, it's also about a matter of interpretation of uh, China's interpretation of UNCLOS. And I'm sorry <clears throat> for being too loquacious and asking too many questions. Um, but uh, Chisa and Eva, uh, pick whatever uh, questions and comments uh, I've raised, uh, and uh, then we will uh, have Hannes, uh, that I see online also, ask a question. In fact, Hannes, since we are like, uh, okay, we'll have a, a very brief round, uh, and then we'll have two questions, one here in presence and one from Hannes. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Julio, for asking me this <laughs> again. <laughs> very difficult question, and I think uh, basically yes. Um, um, many countries in East Asia are using uh, domestic measures to uh, respond or partly resolve uh, the international questions. Um, but if you think about, well, so, so there's a clear tendency for that. Uh, but if you think about that, um, I think uh, the strength uh, China can make for this effort is the biggest. Um, Xi, Jinping has been, uh, Xi Jinping has been arguing that uh, they should uh, use their political system to uh, display their advanta advantage to the international uh, society. Um, he thinks uh, the, uh, the Communist Party system is the Chinese advantage, and he wants to use that to uh, improve China's presence in the world and perhaps to establish uh, priority, its priority in the, uh, on the global sphere. Um, but, that's, uh, but this kind of attitude uh, is also may, uh, bringing a lot of problems because uh, if China tries to do it, then we also have to tackle it against it. Uh, using our, you know, based on our de uh, democratic <laughs> systems too. So in the end, it uh, could become an uh, ideological conflict between the two sides. And I think uh, this tendency is becoming stronger and stronger, uh, unfortunately. So, uh, well, uh, in terms of the fishermen, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. you also asked this uh, question. Um, mm, 
Yes, uh, well, uh, as China started to chase uh, Japanese fishermen and uh, re uh, starting last year or somehow, uh, we don't know the re uh, clear reasons for that. Uh, this, but in Japan Sea, uh, where uh, South Koreans would call uh, East e <laughs> East Sea uh, of Korea, um, we have seen many uh, Chinese fishing vessels uh, gathering and uh, make uh, uh, and uh, fishing the squid. Uh, for some reasons. Uh, China argues uh, it's been controlling its fishing vessels in a very strict way recently, but somehow we see this uh, tendency um, uh, uh, to respond this. Uh, it is true that Japanese fishery agencies has asked uh, the Japanese fishermen not to enter into those area, uh, uh, at least in the Japan Sea to the east, uh, to the area around Senkakus, uh, I have heard that they have asked. And uh, I have heard, uh, I've also heard from uh, Japan Coast Guard people that they haven't. So I, I hear uh, two different ideas. I don't know which is true. Thank you, Eva. Yes, uh, well, I think it's um, a, a lot of it is really about the same topic. We're talking about China using this hybrid uh, gray zone tactics really to, to achieve this game. So either it's lawfare uh, or it's economic pressure or it's, uh, you know, cyber attack, um, hacktivism, whatever you name it. Um, in terms of lawfare, it is really worrying because, uh, well, the Coast Guard law is, is one that we mentioned. There is uh, an example just a few weeks ago of, of Chinese Coast Guards uh, ramming and almost sinking, um, ramming to three Filipino fishing vessels, uh, if you remember, and uh, using water cannons, actually powerful water cannons, to the point that uh, the crew had to abandon the ship. So we're talking about extremely dangerous maneuvers. Uh, to the point that, you know, without even necessarily using a lethal weapon, the use of water cannon, cannon or, or even ramming into a ship could be uh, considered in, in certain circumstances as a weapon. So, uh, you know, the, the consequences are real and, and um, we'll, we'll see what the maritime traffic safety law uh, will do, but, you know, it is really just an, another example of the use of warfare, uh, lawfare. Why it's also worrying is that it allows China to circumvent, it's very convenient, it allows it to circumvent eventual official channels, uh, the few official channels of communication that could have been established. And I'm referring to the queues, for instance. You know, while the queues only applies for military vessels, it does not apply to any other vessels, which are mostly actually uh, the, the, the main actors, it, at least in the South China Sea, is China Sea, which is the fishing militias, which is the coast guards, etc. So it's a, it's a very convenient um, uh, strategy and, and really allows uh, China to kind of win without fighting. Didn't even mention the administrative measures. Uh, I find it very, um, you know, interesting as a, as a study, really, uh, the way China actually included the South China Sea as an administrative um, uh, uh, unit, you know, this is all um, about you know using domestic laws and whatever uh, and applying it to um, the immediate neighborhood or whatever is is considered international by others. Uh, there, there's really a long list of it, and there's very little we can we can do about it precisely because it's it's something that is very difficult to grasp. We're talking about the, you know the eight dragons of uh, of China, which is all the, the different agencies. But once you squeeze one, you are pretty much sure there will be seven others heads that will eventually spur uh, in in different places. But I'm not sure if this is my final possibility to say something uh, as a reaction to what has been said also to Lindsay and and Christian. Um, if, if I may, with, with go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, I've been, um, you know, by uh, any means, I did not mean to say that, you know, China is the only uh, one that breaks the law and, 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 you know, that that is uh, really the major concern. I think that the whole US-China rivalry in itself is extremely um, worrying and, and that dynamic, you know, which is eventually kind of driving and exacerbating all the tensions. And of course, while great powers 
make the rules they can they are the first ones to break the rules and that's why there is uh, you know this plethora and this calls for multilateralism and upholding these international institutions because we are very much aware that both these actors are uh, quite quite guilty um, but when I'm thinking about what uh, Christian said about observing the regional environment for 15 years and things getting steadily worse and the connection between containment and stability, you really got me there and I'm only regretting we cannot really discuss this over a glass of wine, but um, I've been watching the, the region for about the same, uh, same amount of time and, and I'm just wondering if, if the current state is a result of containment because there is many many commentators arguing that one of the reasons why we got there was obama's policy of, of wait and see and precisely not containing anything and I'm, and I'm trying to see inside your head which is really difficult through a camera if you actually think that containment should be um, the answer or, or what sort of answer and i think really that's that's a matter of uh, matter for debate but um we haven't seen anything yet uh, and final final thought on uh, oki no torishima i'm always you know feel like raising lots of hands when when someone mentions the parallel between oki no torishima and the spratlys uh, one major difference between the two oki no torishima is not disputed so uh, under unclose and a lot of you know even customary law whatever there's not a, the, the problem is not to build up a maritime feature you can build up, look at Singapore, look at Japan. I mean, half of the land is built up at sea. That's not an issue at all. Um, as long, but what was the problem with the Spratlys mainly was the fact that it was on a territory that is disputed by a or several uh, other parties. So just, just the parenthesis there. Thank you. I'm sure that uh, both Chris and Lindsay will have uh, a chance to reply in a final round of uh, of remarks uh, that you will all be able to make. But before we get to that stage, uh, we have questions from Hannes Venhart. Uh, thanks for joining in. Uh, the floor is yours. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. OK, great. Um, so I just wanted to come back to the um, discussion on leadership that we touched on earlier. And I was wondering, with respect to Japan, do you see a shift from the upper administration to the administration with respect to maritime security and if yet what what exactly where do you where do you rule this shift and, and where, do, where do you see this thank you fantastic we will uh, um, <clears throat> uh, hope that Chisako would address this question and Jeff uh, I'm sorry I can't read your surname uh, just press the button and uh, yes the floor is yours Uh, hi, um, I'm Jeff. Uh, I'm I'm from the Philippines. So whenever mention about the Filipino fishermen, it's um, you know this this topic is really um, what you call this um, really pressing issue in in my region in Southeast Asia. Um, and I have a couple of questions to uh, all the speakers, but uh, maybe Eva and and Lindsay can give more uh, about this this question anyways um i would like to start on interrogating the the, the notion of trust because i think uh, all the speakers uh, they wasn't able to to give uh, uh, an idea about uh, how maritime security in the in the indo pacific goes when it comes to uh, competing uh, great power power um, um that you know that doesn't go with that, that comes with trust issues, like uh, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of military building, economic, political uh, issues. I think it, it's it's important to discuss uh, this perception of trust between China and Japan, uh, U.S. etc. Et because historically speaking, um, um, I think these uh, great powers are competing because they have these trust issues. So um, in, in in your uh, research. Uh, how how can we address these uh, trust issues um, in the in the Indo-Pacific region? Uh, my second question is about the the regional the presence of the regional multilateral institutions uh, like uh, ASEAN Regional Forum, East Asia Summit, Pacific Island Forum, etc. Um, how these regional multilateral institutions can build uh, uh, a safe 
not safe, but um, you know, quite peaceful future um, in the Indo-Pacific region with the presence of this uh, great power rivalries or, or politics. And, um, um, and, and one of the major aspects of maritime security in Indo-Pacific is the, the idea of uh, the, the rules when it comes to the seas. So, you know, in the Philippines, like Eva mentioned earlier, um, we are one of the, the many countries who experience this bullying of a major power like, like China. And uh, we, can't, uh, we can't do much because uh, militarily we're incapable. So we're just relying on international law. But the 1982 UN Convention uh, on the Law of the Sea, the UN Clause, it's quite... Uh, it's, it's quite limited. So I, I think, what, what can you say about the limitation of this 1982 laws? And is there a call to, to rectify this particular international laws in order to all the claimants be, be heard, especially those in the global south like my country? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, this bouquet of questions. We will uh, then proceed with uh, Chisako. Eva uh, and Lindsay and Chris, and uh, apart from uh, uh, addressing those questions, just give your also final remarks, uh, because then uh, we will uh, uh, wrap things up and uh, uh, it has been a, a marathon and uh, uh, we look forward to the, the last uh, uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, please. Uh, thank you for uh, your good question, uh, Hannes. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm the suitable person to answer. Maybe uh, Eva can uh, say some words afterwards. Uh, but uh, in my understanding, uh, Abe's approach and Kishida's uh, approach may be a little bit different. But in the end, I, I don't think uh, there are two big options for the Japanese diplomacy uh, when we think of uh, how to deal with China. Uh, because, you know, Abe was a big successor of Noda administration, whose party was very different. But actually, uh, Noda, no, well, the policy Noda formulated was succeeded by Abe. So uh, you can see uh, there is a very clear continuity uh, of uh, the foreign policies in Japan, because uh, I don't think uh, the, our outer environment uh, basically decides what we can do, uh, well, our options, pretty much. So uh, that's the first thing. Uh, but uh, maybe Kishida um, is in a new situation right now, uh, prob uh, which is partly uh, which he suc uh, succeeds from uh, Suga administration. Uh, after the COVID-19, uh, probably um, uh, Japan uh, well, uh, Japan, uh, Japanese uh, environment, international environment became much, much better than before uh, because of, uh, thanks to China, perhaps. You know, China's uh, wolf warrior uh, diplomacy was a strategic mistake for that country. But because of that, uh, it, has been, it has been very uh, easier for Japan to uh, strengthen the international cooperation uh, that we wanted to uh, do for so many years. So uh, I think on this part will be um, increased. So uh, we will, uh, I, I, I uh, uh, expect Japanese government to put more efforts in the co quad cooperation and uh, not, not only in the security, traditional security realm, but also in uh, economic security realm as well. And we will uh, uh, strengthen our relations with uh, Europe and uh, uh, other parts of the world. Um, so Kishida's, uh, uh, I think uh, Kishida's new feature will probably be in the economic security realm. Uh, he has uh, appointed new minister for this. Um, uh, but uh, what we uh, discuss in Japan right now is that what, where will be the border? in which area we can still keep cooperation with China and in which area uh, we have to be uh, aware of the risk uh, 
uh, about China more. Um, at this moment, we are not sure about this board. This is very difficult. This is the task that we have never done before. Um, well, of course, uh, um, the United States is pushing very hard for Japan uh, to accept their um, uh, well, uh, you know, sets of idea, but uh, we also think that it's also very uh, dangerous for Japan. I'll simply saying, uh, because uh, their uh, idea is also, of course, based on their national interests, uh, and theirs is very different. When we think about China, they they're competing with China on the global sphere. Uh, so they always think about the how to maintain its global superior <laughs> superiority. But as a neighbor of China, our economic relations with China is more deep, uh, very much integrated. Uh, and uh, we know how important it is. You know, we want to coexist. We want to find a way to coexist China because we are the neighbors. We cannot, you know, move away from the location. Um, so uh, right now, uh, many Japanese experts are discussing how uh, what will be uh, the priority for Japan and how can we decide uh, the borderline in terms of the economic security. You know, in which area we can cooperate and not. Um, they there are risks. Uh, there are many uh, hawkish people, hawkish polit politicians, and also some, um, you know, uh, public voices uh, rising against China. Uh, like uh, if you talk about the politicians, uh, Takaichi, uh, uh, Ms. Takaichi is someone like that, uh, and they're pushing Kishida administration pretty much. Uh, so uh, you know, he tends to listen to too many people. <laughs> so there is a risk that he may get affected by those people too much. So uh, that's something we had been uh, watching at, uh, at this moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eva. Yes, trust issues, uh, I love it. If there was a, a name of a novel about East Asian politics, it could be trust issues, really. Um, frankly, yes, that's that's what, you know, that's the defining feature uh, of, of international relations in, in the region, be it historical reasons, be it imperialist uh, expansion, be it colony, colonization. I mean, there are major trust issues, but in often, uh, actually, they are quite convenient for uh, for the domestic uh, politicians. They are very conveniently exploited. I mean, if you just look at the the, the triangle, the China, Korea, um, Japan triangle, frankly, in, in all sides, you would find a, a political, uh, very targeted manipulation and or, or use and abuse of trust issues for political gains. So it is not something that we can remedy off. I think that the politicians are well aware of what needs to be done if they wanted to. Uh, and, and, and here we would talk about the very lengthy and painful process of, of historical um, examination textbooks or whatever you name it and, and educating the you know youth exchanges or whatever uh, but uh, we need what needs to we want we know what needs to be done but if it's not done it's that it's usually convenient politically and that would be in a, in a, in a you know just a short answer on the Philippines case versus China, frankly, I'm, I'm a huge fan of this and we could talk for, for hours just on, on, uh, on this case. I mean, I have huge um, admiration towards uh, Filipino lawyers and the way that it was uh, drafted, the way it was crafted uh, and conducted. It was, a, it was a wonderful textbook example of how a small state could use international law um, to, to clarify an extremely obscure and difficult international uh, situation and eventually win. I find it was a, uh, a hugely uh, a regrettably missed opportunity uh, for, for Duterte not to follow up immediately, but nonetheless, it is really not too late or all things are not lost. And that's the thing. Um, the verdict is always going to be there and it will be forever uh, a reference when it comes to the South China Sea. So uh, afterwards, of course, we can always question the, the, the 
legitimacy of the International Tribunal, but that's another discussion. But until further notice, it is and will become a reference. I find maybe one way to go or an encouraging, at least, development was the deposition, consecutive deposition of Nodverbal uh, at the United Nations by the different Asian uh, countries and European countries. And in that sense, typically for a European uh, for European countries, plural, or European Union as such, uh, it would be almost a, a shame and a, and a call of a civil responsibility to follow suit. Uh, that's the least we can do as, you know, if we uh, still want to, to claim ourselves as uh, a normative superpower uh, or a defender of rule of law. And I'll probably stop at that. Thank you. Um, Lindsay and then uh, Chris, and uh, we, were, uh, we wrap up. Lindsay. Thanks. Um, I find myself agreeing a lot with what uh, Eva and um, Saka just said. I think those were excellent uh, responses uh, from them. I think what I would add in, in terms of Hannes's question, I think it's going to take a while before um, Kishida can really assert his own independence as um, the prime minister. But what we have seen over the last 20 years is the rise of the prime minister's office, the Kante, and the Kante having so much more power. So if he does stay, and that's a big if in Japanese politics, then hopefully in a year's time, maybe two years time, we'll see him being able to assert himself a little bit more. But the, the factions are so important in Japan, and Abe still runs the, the most powerful faction, and Aso, the, I think the second most powerful. So they're going to have a strong hand on the direction of Japanese politics. Uh, and Kishida's already slipping up a little bit on um, on COVID uh, responses and so forth. So it's, you know, we'll watch this space. Um, for, for trust, for that question of trust, I think when it comes to things like the East China Sea, the South China Sea, what's the way forward? We've tried, if you like, military containment. And in a way, that's what's led to the gray zone activities. That's led to the lawfare that, you know, China, but China and Russia have both tried operating outside of the normal frames to, to, to try and achieve what they want. Um, I think containment will only get you so far, right? That will only maintain a certain status quo in the region for as long as it holds. And I think this is what China is testing in, in East Asian waters. You need to build some sort of confidence, some sort of trust on tangible issues and really go for the low lying fruit. You know, things like navigational aids. Let's have an agreement on navigational aids in the South China Sea. That's not exciting. No one's, no one's gonna sort of be, uh, be cheering about that. But from there, you can then take the next step to thinking about how do we protect the environment? How do we, how do we develop um, better protocols for search and rescue? How do we then go from there to deal with illegal fishing and so on and so forth? It's building sort of functional cooperation, it's traditional neoliberal spillover, if you like. That's the kind of thing that can build trust over, over the longer term. Um, one other response to Hannes, just because it's on my mind, Japan, Japan's longer term. This is something where we can talk about one particular trend that we haven't mentioned, and that's its aging society. And if there's one thing that no Japanese politician has done anything significant on in the last 20 odd years, it's Japan's aging society. Absolutely nothing has been done that I've seen, right? One person who, who did have an influence or did have an idea in terms of opening up Japan to, to greater immigration was Konotaro, but he lost the, uh, the election for prime minister. So this is something that's important for Japan to deal with, including in terms of maritime security. Japan doesn't have the, rec the recruits for the self-defense forces. It doesn't have the recruits for the Japan Coast Guard going forward. So it can't fill the necessary positions it needs to fill to have the robust security it needs. And that's to do with the number of people in its country. So this is another area that uh, it's worth mentioning going forward.
That's it for me. Thank you. And then, Chris, you have the final yeah. word. You, uh, you can wrap everything up and <laughs> tell us uh, how it is. Yeah, I, just, uh, I wonder if you know, I expected to Eva's question about containment. I mean, we haven't discussed any of my question yet, which I think uh, I find as a kind of maybe as an example of how direct, how important or very crucial things even though everything was said was very important and interesting. Some very basic questions are not really addressed or pushed aside. So I um, would like just to make a statement which is part, not based on my research now, but on, on my impression, I would say, of somewhat speculative and tends to be, uh, of course, criticized later. But my hunch is that what we are seeing now at the moment is a kind of continuation of muddling through that we've seen before, where we talk about cooperation and engagement, where of course China has very much hardened its, its stance that it's going to be even continuing like that under Xi Jinping and possibly there will be more instability after, you know, when the question of Xi Jinping's successor, uh, you know, arises inevitably, which makes it dangerous. Um, and, and I think we, we keep on ignoring this, this kind of fundamental dynamic and it seems to me that Containment has, where well, like this, the Olympicity become, you know, the the solution or seen as the solution all the way uh, politics advance uh, in terms of security. And I just wonder whether people really thought hard about what this is going to be doing. I think the current tensions over the Taiwan Strait are part of this, indirectly part of this, uh, or an effect of this development. And I, I get the impression that there's this, you know, it goes down to the bit more fundamental question, how do we look at the past? And if people thought the Cold War was the stable period where we had containment, we are where we had the good and the bad ones, and that the US won uh, because of more defense expenditure and, and a stronger economy, uh, um, that uh, people try to kind of repeat this in some way this pattern. Whereas if you look at the Cold War and the Cold War's end in a way of saying, well, it was really, you know, a close call that we didn't get nuked and uh, it ended because Gorbachev was in power because there was the Austrian politics by the Chancellor Brandt and others, of course, under the umbrella of the, of the nuclear confrontation. And that this helped to diffuse things, then you might come to a different conclusion and say, well, we shouldn't head more towards Containment because this is making things worse and probably pushing us towards the tipping point we had base. Thank you. Thank you. On, on that note, on uh, the incognita that we are facing, also in terms of uh, uh, what strategy works and how we will, uh, we will understand uh, um, the rapidly evolving uh, regional landscape uh, and worsening in many ways. Uh, uh, how is it that uh, uh, leadership transition will also redefine uh, that uh, regional landscape, uh, both uh, from uh, Japan, the, uh, China, and again, we haven't mentioned the US because we might get uh, Pompeo in 2024, uh, winning the 2024 elections. I mean, he lost weight, maybe he's running for office. Um, <clears throat> or Trump uh, or other mini Trumps. And so that, that's going to, again, impact uh, also in the region. And so that is a perfect, uh, um, uh, well, uh, worrisome landscape uh, uh, that requires you to come to Florence uh, in a few years time and to uh, have this converse, conversation again, hopefully in presence. Um, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for today's uh, wonderful discussion and conversation. Uh, we will have uh, a glass of red uh, uh, also for you guys here in Florence. <laughs> and uh, I hope to, to see you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot and happy holidays, everyone. Thank you. You too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.